Our next speaker is an expert in, in turbulent modeling. Uh, he's in Gianluca Iacarino's uh, lab, and uh, he's going to be talking about uh, neural networks for, for turbulence. Thank you, Nikita. Hello, I'm Nikita Kozak. I'm a mechanical engineering PhD student, and today I'll be talking about advancing equivariant graph neural networks for turbulence modeling. And that's a mouthful, so we'll jump right in. Um, so the problem I work on is computational fluid dynamics at, at a high level, and CFD is what engineers use to simulate how a flow behaves, whether it's over an object or through an object. And so here we see a flow over a car, and engineers care about the high speed as well as the low speed regions in order to predict like the drag. Um, the way these simulations work is we define a mesh, and for each cell in the mesh, we solve the Navier-Stokes equations. There's one term in this equation that makes it complicated. It's the Reynolds stress tensor. So this term is responsible for how momentum and energy transfers between small scales, so small little uh, swirls, wakes, or eddies, to large-scale flow structures. And so we can explicitly compute it, but that means our mesh has to be really fine to capture those small-scale structures. What we can do instead is we can coarsen our mesh, and then we can assume a universal behavior across all length scales. By doing so, we end up kind of smoothing the flow field, but we introduce a lot of inaccuracies because we're making almost an approximation. So when engineers have an opportunity to des design something, right, they have this high-fidelity approach that's going to run on a supercomputer, probably using 1,000 CPUs for weeks to months at a time, or they could probably run something on their laptops. Um, that's probably going to take a day, but it's going to be inaccurate, and they often don't know how inaccurate it will be. So we can integrate machine learning into this, where we pass a low-fidelity solution into a model, and that model is going to predict a new Reynolds stress tensor. And then this tensor is going to get fed back into a low-fidelity simulation, and then we're going to rerun it, and hopefully it's going to come to the outcome of its high-fidelity counterpart at the end of it. Now, the problem with this is um, in literature, people will create a model, and they'll test and train on pretty identical flow fields, and then argue, uh, because we've done turbulence, um, it's generalizable, but then you throw it at a different geometry and just horrible. And so then we took the largest readily available data set, which includes four different geometries across 28 simulations with different flow speeds, and applied it in the same problem. And we saw that a random forest can really match any state-of-the-art model, and our in-house best barely beat it. So we kind of came at this crossroads where we either needed a lot more data or we had to do something completely different. And so we decided to go with equivariance, and I'm going to take a step away from turbulence to give you guys a feel for it. And I'm also going to talk about CNNs. I don't use CNNs, but it's easier to grasp the concept. I'm going to guess a lot of people are familiar with CNNs, but for those who aren't, a CNN operates by passing a filter across an input and identifying how that pattern matches in the output. So here we're looking for ones and zeros in certain positions, and the output just tells us if that pattern was matched. And in a classical example of how a CNN classifies an object, um, it passes a filter along the pixels to then form edges. Then it will pass another filter to combine those edges into parts, and finally combine those parts into the objects itself. But if we look at it, how it operates across different objects, here we show faces, cars, elephants, and chairs, if you look at the bottom row, all the edges are pretty similar. They're just rotations and deviations of each other. So we can actually use this to make our models more efficient. And so we're going to walk through this one more time. And on the right of the screen, there's a filter. In the middle is the image. We're going to pass that filter across. And on the left side is the feature map that tells us where did that filter match the image. So traditionally, a CNN is going to pass this filter and it's going to indicate where the information is found. Here we're just rotating the filter, but a CNN wouldn't actually know it's rotating it. It would think it's all independent. Um, and so there's a lot of repeated information, and that video is getting a little blurry. But what we can do instead is we can store a basis function. And storing that basis function, we just see that one filter, and we say what orientations it's at. And so that's really the power of uh, rotational equivariance. So you can recognize any pattern in just a single instance at any orientation. And this can be applied for rotations, translations, as well as reflections. And so I use something called uh, a steerable equivariant graph neural network, and it operates pretty similarly, except instead of having a filter, it uses like geometric tensors to find basis functions. Now we're going to see it in a pretty simple problem. So this is called potential flow. So we take out turbulence, and it's irrotational and inviscid. 
uh, but it still has a lot of characteristics of the Navier Stokes. And so the framework is going to be we're going to pass the mesh as an input as well as the velocity, pressure, and the pressure gradients at each point in the mesh, and we're going to try predicting the stress tensor as our output. We're also going to compare it to three other models, one which is just a standard fully connected neural network, um, a graph neural network with a tension mechanism, and finally point net, which was designed for only translational equivariance. And so the objective here is, right, we're, we're mapping from this input flow field, which is like velocity, and we're trying to predict this output tensor. So I'm going to walk through a plot that shows the error versus a different testing training regime. So on the y-axis, we have the normalized error. And I'll mention how we normalize in a few clicks. On the x-axis are the different testing training regimes, and I'll introduce them once at a time. And then finally, the different um, lines correspond to the different models, SegNet being the solid black line. So to just set up a baseline and get an error of one, we train and test on the same flow field. It's just a circle, and the flow enters in the same direction. Now in the second case, we're going to train with the flow entering one way, and then we're going to test at a rotation. So this is, uh, if we're connecting the dots, it's like rotating the smiley face. And what we can see is Segnet's error stays constant, while a lot of the other models' error just explodes. And now we're going to do the same for translation. Um, so now we move the flow field, and this is similar to like moving a smiley face to a different part of the image. And what we can see is Segnet is dominant, uh, point net starts to rival it, but if we zoom in, it's about 40% higher than SegNet. And now we're going to do something interesting where we rotate and translate it. Um, we can see SegNet's error stays constant. However, PointNet has an interesting behavior where it actually mislearned equivariance. You can see that as when they're separated between rotation and translation, the errors are bounded, um, while when it's both, it kind of explodes, and this is different from the other models. Now we're going to kind of change it up, and we're going to train on a circle flow, and then test on a ellipse flow. We see SegNet's dominant. Now we're going to introduce one more case in training. So we train on a circle and ellipse, and test on a thinner ellipse. SegNet stays dominant, and it's about three to five times better than any other model. We're going to keep doing this, and we're going to add two more cases for training, so a few more ellipses, and SegNet is dominant again. But there's a question of how, many much, how much more data do we need to provide before one of these other architectures catch up, catches up to SegNet. So that's what we're going to do here. And we're actually just going to look at rotation. So the whole time we're trying to test the flow coming in at the red angle. And we're going to provide different um, training cases between either the green arrows or the yellow arrows. And that's going to dictate if the neural network is going to have to interpolate or extrapolate. So on the y-axis here, we're going to have the error relative to segment, and on the x-axis is the number of cases we're going to add, and so those are between the two um, arrows here. And then uh, the solid lines are going to be testing lines, and then the dotted ones are going to be training, and what we see, regardless if we add 8 or 30 <coughs> cases, none of them are actually going to catch up to segment, and it's going to be almost 15 times greater then. And then we're going to see this again, but for the sake of time, I'll go, it, go through it quickly. You can add 100 more instances of data, and it's not going to catch up to SegNet, and that's really the power of equivariance. So hopefully in this simple problem, we've demonstrated how powerful equivariance is. Now we're going to pivot to turbulence. Um, so again, as a refresher, we're trying to predict that Reynolds stress tensor, and we do it by feeding a low-fidelity simulation into our model and then predicting the Reynolds stress tensor. And so here's how a Reynolds stress tensor looks for a low fidelity simulation. And then this is its high fidelity counterpart. You can see large differences in magnitude as well as structure. So the mapping is vastly different. And this is the same thing just for a different geometry. But when we talk about rotations in this context, it's not necessarily that you just rotate the image, you actually change the flow regimes. But locally, there are some um, local, physics, local physics that do just rotate. So we're going to train on the circle as well as a handful of ellipses, but each size is maybe seen once to twice at different angles, and then test at all the unseen ones. And so this is one of the testing cases, and we can see how well SegNet performs. Um, if you observe the far left column, which is the error, we can see all the errors actually downstream of the object, which is great, as a lot of the most important information is near uh, the body. And then we show this again for a different uh, object, and the same story applies. But what really matters is, can an engineer then use this to help design their system? And so 
Now we feed that prediction back into our simulation um, and get a new flow field. And what we can see is with the corrected uh, flow field, um, the velocity field looks much more like its high fidelity counterpart, as well as the drag now, instead of being about 25% inaccurate, it's about 5%. So it's a huge improvement. But getting SegNet to actually work this well isn't straightforward. And this is just like a vanilla layer of it. And I won't go through all the details, but I do want to highlight how there's four input parameters, which are node and edge features, as well as node and edge attributes. And that really uh, exponentially increases the hyperparameter space. We also have learnable weights at five instances per every layer. And this makes the loss landscape really hard to navigate. And I'll demonstrate it here where we have 50 different architecture setups. A lot of them are similar, but very few actually yield really good performance. And so this is the loss plot over Epoch. And you can see how some of them have an error that's 10 to the negative sixth, while most of them are 10 to the negative third. Um, and so with that, hopefully, um, what you take away from this presentation is equivariance is super powerful. And in the application for turbulence modeling, it's promising. And Marlow really allows me to experiment, optimize, and enhance equivariant neural networks. As they're, they're really sensitive. Um, and I would love to acknowledge Marlow and uh, everyone at Stanford Data Science for this amazing computing resource, as well as my um, uh, two fellowships that support my funding and my PI, John Luca, and my research mentors, Diego and Luca. So with that, is there any questions? How, how many nodes do you use? Do you, do, you need, do you need a lot? This is a small scale. I was almost imagining something like a, an idealized building of a plane wing or something mm -hmm. like that, right? At least to my naive yeah. uh, <laughs> knowledge, so to speak. My question is, how, how much computational research do you need? And for example, would you be able to use all of Marlowe or oh, yeah, something yes. like that? Yeah, so I guess just to train one of the models, I use about eight GPUs. Um, that's about like uh, about 10 million learnable parameters and it trains for about 12 hours. Um, the good thing about turbulence is if, if you learn it on like a simple flow, how we just saw over uh, a circle or ellipse, that it should translate to more complex geometries like an airplane. Um, so I don't necessarily see the cost associated with training the model, but it's rather making the simulations that will exponentially increase.